This is an RNZ podcast. This is Media Watch. I'm Colin Peacock. On the programme this week, reports of crime are on the up in our media, so maybe it's no surprise that the public's concern is peaking along with the coverage. But does the story change when reporters run the numbers before running a story? And after another turbulent week for Auckland's mayor, we find out how news bosses reacted to his arm's-length media policy and how his people reacted to that in turn. But first, how stories about the war in Ukraine ended up with a pro-Russian slant on RNZ's website, prompting a review of RNZ's online news publishing. It looks like someone has edited the Reuters feed to publish on RNZ, but they've, they've changed some of the language to make it look a bit more Kremlin-friendly. Uh, it's understood a, staff, a staffer has been stood down. This must be just sort of RNZ's worst nightmare, given that people often refer to it as Kremlin Radio. <laughs> the state radio. <laughs> yeah. That was Tim Beveridge on News Talk ZB's weekend collective show yesterday, highlighting a surprising story which broke the day before and which has indeed been a bit of a nightmare for RNZ News and its bosses. And while some of RNZ's critics who reckon it does lean a bit to the left do call it Red Radio from time to time, as the ACT Party did responding to those revelations on Friday, it doesn't really have a reputation as pro-Putin. So ZB's Tim Beveridge was just kidding when he said this. When they managed to slip another Kremlin-friendly story, I can just imagine it. Welcome to Radio New Zealand today. Vladimir Putin, great guy. Uh, sorry, you, Janet, I'm being you, mischievous. You should audition. <laughs> <laughs> but Tim Beveridge did acknowledge this was a serious issue because the story's concerned the war in Ukraine, which is, of course, one of the most serious issues of our time. Now, one of the problems with covering the war in Ukraine is that so many of the reports of what's happening day to day are hotly contested and sometimes completely contradicted by the warring parties and their allies. There's also a steady stream of unverifiable information and images from the conflict, as well as outright propaganda, a lot of it state-sanctioned and some even state-created, which the news media then have to wade through and weigh up. And that also applies to accounts of the reasons that this war was started in the first place, including the preceding annexation of Crimea nine years ago. And this week, a New York-based Twitter user calling himself Southpaw was startled to find what he called Russian propaganda about that under the byline of the Moscow bureau chief of respected news agency Reuters, republished on RNZ's website. He picked out parts of the story from rnz.co.nz on Thursday night, which said the conflict in the Ukraine began in 2014 after a pro-Russian elected government was toppled during Ukraine's violent Maidan colour revolution. Now, colour revolution is often used by people describing protest movements that they believe to be backed by foreign powers, and it's the sort of loaded language that a news agency like Reuters would never use. Its role is to supply straight and opinion-free news and information to media publishers around the world. But the same RNZ story also said Russia annexed Crimea after a referendum as the new pro-Western government suppressed ethnic Russians in Ukraine. Now that's an assertion that Russia used to justify the invasion at that time, and President Putin aired it again before invading Ukraine in February last year. But independent experts have said it's baseless, and back in 2014, the BBC's correspondent in Kiev called it demonstrably false. Now on Twitter, the pseudonymous Southpaw later told his followers that a Reuters representative had been in touch with him to say that language that appeared on RNZ's website was not written by Reuters or by their Moscow bureau chief Guy Falkenbridge. Now someone else who noticed all this was a Kiwi based in Paris, Jeff Upton, who also took to Twitter to show the difference between RNZ's version of Guy Falkenbridge's story and the one his employers at Reuters published, in which their man in Moscow had merely said... The conflict in eastern Ukraine began in 2014 after a pro-Russian president was toppled in Ukraine's Maidan revolution and Russia annexed Crimea. And that is a much more neutral account of what actually happened back then, as you would expect from a news agency like Reuters. Jeff Upton then said that he'd spoken to Reuters as well and had been told by them the story was apparently altered by a journalist at RNZ. Now, early on Friday afternoon, a footnote appeared on the story on rnz.co.nz saying that it had indeed been edited inappropriately and had now been corrected. Soon after that, at 4pm on Friday, RNZ News listeners heard this. RNZ is investigating how a story on the Ukraine conflict on its website and Twitter channel was changed to reflect a pro-Russian view. 
The original Reuters story published yesterday traced the conflict's origin to 2014 when a pro-Russian Ukrainian president was toppled and Russian-backed separatist forces annexed Crimea. But the version published by RNZ included a false account of the events. The story has since been corrected. But by Friday afternoon, more recent Reuters-originated stories about Ukraine also appeared to have an added pro-Russian flavour. Another one about the first large-scale airstrikes in nearly two months, which claimed that Russia launched its invasion of Ukraine, claiming that a US-backed coup in 2014, with the help of neo-Nazis, had created a threat on its borders, and that that had ignited a civil war which saw Russian-speaking minorities persecuted. But that last example was from late April, and it's surprising no one noticed the inflammatory additions to it until Friday's revelations prompted a look back. Now having said that no further comment would be made until an investigation is complete, RNZ confirmed late on Friday night that the alleged conduct of one employee is under investigation. The statement said the staffer had been placed on leave and there will be an audit of other articles to check for further problems. So far, RNZ have corrected seven Reuters articles that had been altered, the changes going unnoticed for six months, popping up in January, February, March and then twice in April and twice in June. By Saturday evening, the number of inappropriately edited online stories had swelled to 14, and Chief Executive Paul Thompson announced there'd be an external review of RNZ's online news editing processes, with all the findings to be made public. Radio New Zealand is investigating after pro-Russian rhetoric was published on its website. The minister calls it worrying. A staff member is stood down. While TVNZ's One News led with that development on Saturday here, in the UK, the inappropriate editing also prompted the Associate Defence Editor of the Daily Telegraph, Dom Nichols, to say this in the paper's daily podcast of the latest news from Ukraine. I highlight that because I think it, I think it's pretty interesting anyway, a bit, bit clunky, I'm sure they'll be able to get to the bottom of who, who did that. But just to highlight the, 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 the fight, the war that is happening in the information, on the, as I say, on the information flank of this war, of which we are... Yeah, we're a part of that, and so are you. And I just urge you again, just just be careful with everything you consume. There's a there's an absolute torrent of information out there. There's agendas all over the place. Just be very very careful. But I thought that absolutely highlighted how how this can be, how words can be twisted or invented. It's the drip 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 effect. So just got to be careful with the um, with where you're drawing your information from. And who's handling that information and how they're doing it? He could have added, because as we now know. It was going on for months at RNZ before anybody noticed. Now something else that has to be addressed, if it hasn't already, is RNZ's relationship with Reuters, which knows about the problem but has not yet responded to our request for comment on it. We also contacted two former news agency bosses for comment on this, but they were not keen to say anything until they knew more details. Now, the terms of global news agencies' agreements with news media organisations vary, but commonly they do allow media customers to edit supplied stories for length and to permit the addition of relevant details specific to the territory in question. Including passages of text and stories published by client media companies is also usually OK, and there may be mistakes or inadvertent ambiguities in the agency's copy, and it's fine for clients like RNZ to finesse the stories a bit before republication. But significant editorial changes, like the politically charged ones added to those Ukraine war stories, are not OK if the published story is still attributed to the agency which supplied it. And that's especially so when it's under the byline of a Moscow bureau chief of the world's second biggest news gatherer, which has rigorous editorial standards of its own and style guides that are rigorously applied. Adding things in this way is actually akin to another cardinal sin of journalism, plagiarism, though here, rather than co-opting the author's work without acknowledging it, things the author didn't write have been inserted in his name. Now, Reuters' website terms and conditions warn that you may not remove, alter, forward, scrape, frame, copy, sell, distribute or create derivative works without our prior written consent. So Media Watch this week also asked RNZ, how is it permitted to alter content from Reuters? But we were told again, there will be no comment on that until the investigation is complete and any appropriate action taken. 
Now, that action might include updating RNZ's editorial policy, which does have a section on material from external sources, but doesn't specify news agency suppliers. RNZ's editorial policies also say that audiences should not be able to detect a presenter or journalist's personal views. Staff will have opinions of their own, the policies say, but they must not yield to bias or prejudice. To be professional is not to be without opinions, but to be aware of those opinions and make allowances for them so that reporting is judicious and fair. This weekend, the ACT Party demanded action to prevent RNZ becoming, in its words, a conduit for Putin's propaganda, while the broadcasting minister said that he'd been briefed on the matter by RNZ's board chair by text message. And the founder of the local campaign group Mahi for Ukraine, Kate Turska, told Stuff that a state-funded broadcaster should adopt the highest journalistic standards, especially when it comes to issues of war and geopolitics, which could sway public opinion. Now, all parties are surely on the same page about that, over words that should not have appeared on RNZ's web pages in the first place. So watch the space then to see what appropriate action will be taken by RNZ to restore any loss of trust or confidence in RNZ News as a result of all this. Let's go to this correction story. There are fears that some criminals won't end up in jail after reports that Wellington police were told to, quote, carefully consider making arrests because Rimutaka prison was nearly full. That was Ryan Bridge on the AM show back on the 17th of April, and those fears he spoke of there were sparked by a front-page story in the Herald on Sunday just the day before. Under the headline, Exclusive, full prison prompts shock order. The paper said that frontline police had been told to consider the necessity of arrests in some circumstances because the country's largest prison was almost full. Now this claim was based on an email from a senior police sergeant to Wellington colleagues which said that offenders arrested for breaching bail conditions might be remanded in police custody for a prolonged period due to Rimataka prison being near maximum occupancy. And an unnamed police source then told the paper... I have no idea what the threshold is for being held in police custody now. That's worrying stuff. And according to the Herald on Sunday, this directive would also be a headache for the police minister, Jenny Anderson, because... Law and order is shaping up as an election year battleground as Labour tries to deflect criticism it is soft on crime. And some of that criticism was coming from the National Party's police spokesperson, Mark Mitchell, who was pictured in the Herald on Sunday, along with this quote... We've reached a point where police officers are being asked to make arrest decisions based on government failures rather than public safety. The ACT Party also responded to the story with a media statement and later a line in its law and order policy said this. Frontline prison officers are being told to think twice before arresting criminals because prisons like Rimutaka are too full. But are they? The Herald on Sunday's exclusive also quoted a police spokesperson as saying that instruction from Wellington had not been introduced due to any capacity issues at any prison. The same day, Police Association President Chris Cahill told RNZ he was surprised to read Rimataka prison was near capacity, given a decline in prison populations around the country, and Corrections Minister Kelvin Davis told News Hub there was still room for another 583 prisoners across prisons in New Zealand. Now, after referring to those fears about offenders at large on the AM show back on the 17th of April, presenter Ryan Bridge then echoed the minister's number like this. But the Department of Corrections says there is enough capacity to manage any one police decide it should be remanded in their custody. Corrections says Rimutaka Prison has 750 beds for prisoners. 61 of those are currently vacant. And after that... Corrections Acting National Commissioner Lee Marsh told Ryan Bridge this. The reality is we've got nearly 600 vacancies across our network as our population's sitting around 8,450. So the reality is if someone needs to come to prison, they can come to prison. We've got plenty of space. And Lee Marsh went on to say it's long been common practice to consider whether an offender breaching bail or warrant conditions really needs to be held in a police cell over long weekends if the risk of delaying arrest isn't really high. And Police Association President Chris Carhill told ZB something similar the same day. The real issue here, police stations aren't the place to remand prisoners. So prisoners that are already 
Um, you know, these aren't people who have reached their pay. These are people that are awaiting trial and serious charges. And, um, you know, it's interesting that this is happening now when we've actually got a very low prison population. So to me, corrections should be managing their prisoners better. Now, all this doesn't mean there are no problems with prison capacity these days, as the AM show's Ryan Bridge pointed out at the time. Our prisons can currently house up to 9,020 inmates. That is down from the usual 9,561 because they haven't got enough staff. And one month earlier, Stuff had reported that only one of the country's prisons, Christchurch Women's, is fully staffed these days. And Mount Eden Jail has more than 100 unfilled vacancies. And that's the reason the Corrections Department has spent more than $2.5 million this year on ad campaigns to recruit more officers. But back in mid-April, Rimutaka Prison was not full and offenders weren't at large because of it as the Herald on Sunday's front page told readers at the time, as well as opposition politicians critical of the government's record. Now in the two months since then, there have been many more worrying stories in the media about rising crime, and this past week was no exception. Crime and law and order has really spiked in the last, since the last time they did this uh, a couple of months ago. Um, uh, I think now about 40% of people are really worried about crime and law and order. There was stuff political editor Luke Melpass there talking about the latest Ipsos New Zealand Issues Monitor picking up increased public concern about crime, as did his RNZ counterpart Jane Patterson alongside him on Morning Report's political wrap of the week last Friday. Because since if you look at that crime um, law and order um, finding from February 2022, it didn't even feature in the top five, and you've just seen it really steadily climb up and now to be um, number two. And look, you've had ram raids, you've got reports of violent crime, gangs, but also you've got that political focus and that campaign from National Soft on Crime. You've also had a lot of disruption in that um, police portfolio, a roll call of different ministers. Ginny Anderson, the new um, minister, under fire this week for comments that she made in relation to the extra police, the 1800 about New Zealanders feeling safe and nationals picked up on that. So I think there's a political element too in terms of how people are feeling. Well, how people are feeling about crime is one thing. Likewise, politicians responding with claims of soft on crime. But the hard facts change the story. Hayden Donnell now looks at efforts to put the news in crime in context using data for starters. Really do encourage everyone who can make a difference, can make a difference, to now make a difference. We've, we've got a duty to keep customers and to keep teams safe in stores. And when you see uh, retail crime up 38%, serious assaults up 36 and repeat offenders being responsible for over a third of all reported retail crime, you know, we absolutely have to acknowledge we have an issue uh, and now we need to look at every mm. possible way we can solve the issue. That's Foodstuff's Chief Executive Chris Quinn on RNZ's Morning Report earlier this week, raising the alarm about what he said is a scary rise in crime at the company's supermarkets. There were even reports that supermarket staff might need body cams. Some people raised their eyebrows at the timing of Quinn's media push, given a day earlier Consumer NZ had hit out at the supermarket giants over allegations they're ripping customers off with dodgy specials. But Quinn's not the first to air his concerns about rising retail crime in recent weeks. The owners of Tetarangi's only post shop, Shrikant and Aboli Bave, did a series of media interviews in May saying they were closing their doors after two decades in business over repeated burglaries. Prime Minister Chris Hipkins was interviewed straight after the pair on AM and had this to say to Ryan Bridge. I think it's absolutely heartbreaking and it is totally unacceptable. I absolutely acknowledge that the situation we're facing around retail crime at the moment um, with ram raids and with aggravated robberies is utterly unacceptable. Those ram raids Hipkins mentioned dominated the headlines last year with some media outlets reporting what they called a youth crime spike or youth crime wave. The barrage of coverage seems to have had an influence on people's perceptions of crime. On Monday this week, the Herald reported the results of an exclusive poll which showed 67% of New Zealanders are more concerned about being a victim of crime than they were five years ago. Respondents were also asked what action they want to see to address crime. The largest number, 34%, wanted harsher prison sentences, while 27% wanted more police. Just 4% wanted more social workers and other support, and 6% wanted a focus on rehabilitation rather than prison. 
These perceptions may be understandable given the real rise in headline-grabbing types of crime like ram raids. But they don't always mesh with the data released by authorities. Police numbers showed youth crime was actually down 2% year-on-year in 2022, though there were big rises in South Auckland and Canterbury. Some of the tough-on-crime solutions favoured by the public also clash with the evidence on what makes people safer. For instance, last year polling showed 70% of people support the idea of putting serious youth offenders in year-long boot camps. University of Canterbury sociologist and gangs researcher Jared Gilbert looked at the studies bringing together all the data on boot camps around the world and came to this conclusion on TVNZ's Breakfast. The research shows, the data shows quite clearly that these programs have very limited success or no success um, and in and on rare occasions actually make the problems worse. Now, on that last point, I mean, I was kind of interested in that because how how does a program make something worse? And the shorthand is, and you hear it and we've heard it in the media in the last day or two, is that we make fitter, faster young criminals. Many of the daily stories on crime don't include that kind of context or expert comment, and some commentators have aired concerns that the unrelenting flow of alarming headlines is presenting the public with a distorted picture. Here's criminologist Trevor Bradley on Stuff's daily news podcast, Newsable. In the local area, regardless of whether it was a high crime community or not, because they had access to lots of different sources of information, including talking to neighbours and friends and colleagues or whatever, they had a much you know, better appreciation of the kind of level of risks that they were exposed to. Whereas when we asked them about their perceptions of crime in other parts of the country, they were much more inclined to say that, yes, that's a big problem. Mm. Why? Well, because they were relying on national media, essentially. And so their picture of crime was not experiential. It was totally kind of learned or gleaned from the media. Last week, a pair of New Zealand Herald reporters laid out their best effort to get to the reality behind the crime reports. Under the headline... Is Labour really soft on crime? The numbers reveal a surprising story. Data journalist Chris Knox and political reporter Michael Nielsen collated stats from what they described as a vast array of sources on crime rates in New Zealand over the last 43 years. They found reported victims of crime were up 11.9% since Labour came to power, while the number of offenders arrested is down 25.4% and convictions are down 26.2%. So far, so good for those saying crime is out of control and Labour is failing to stop it. But Knox and Nielsen present a lot of nuance behind their findings. They say much of the increase in reported retail crime, for instance, is due to a new system that allows retailers to automatically notify police of minor offences that may previously have gone unreported. And when it comes to charges and convictions, John Key's national government oversaw an even greater drop than Labour under Jacinda Ardern. I asked the two to explain what drew them to a data investigation on crime and what news organisations could do to improve how they report on such a thorny, complicated topic. Kia ora, Michael and Chris. Welcome to Media Watch. Kia ora, Hayden. Good to be here. Yeah, kia ora, Hayden. Thanks. So why did you do this investigation? We would look back in December. We were looking, thinking about things that uh, we thought would be uh, key election issues to spend some time looking at the data behind some of those issues. A lot, a lot of kind of data sets are kind of simple at first glance, but there's a whole lot of background. Uh, and so we thought it would be a useful contribution to an election year to kind of have... I guess a go-to explainer on on a on a few topics, and uh, crime was one of them. Michael, I think you tweeted something like that. You just got sick of being asked to do fact checks on political claims about crime. Working in the press gallery, we, we're constantly getting bombarded, you know, with with media releases and and statements from politicians, and we're seeing an increasing trend in the use of terms like soft on crime, and this government needs to get tough on crime, and be using. Um, statistics from various sources, from police, from justice, to try and 
tell that story, to add to that kind of atmosphere of you know, crime getting out of control. But certain cases, we would look into those stats and we'd find actually if you show it in a bigger context, it tells quite a different story. One good example was around retail crime. The numbers are definitely exploding. I mean, they've, they've tripled um, the reports of, in retail crime under Labour government. But when you look into the way that it's reported, it, it became a lot easier for um, stores to report low-level shoplifting offences that previously weren't being reported. So we found with that context, it, it, it made it more difficult to, to paint that picture. And we, we also found the same with Ram Raids data, um, both for, both political parties, Labour and National, using different different months to kind of compare a, a rise or a fall in, in, in those stats. So we were kind of getting yeah frustrated at constantly having to to fact check these and and the flaws in some of their data and and that sort of fed into working with with Chris to do a, a, a broader piece. That's the perception out there: crime is out of control. There's these allegations that Labour is soft on crime. That's the context of your piece. How much did you find those claims marry up with your analysis of the data? One of the most revealing things for for me, anyway was looking back at the longer term trends and seeing some of the, the things we might associate with with a, a soft on crime government. So you know, lower charging rates and conviction rates. And looking back at the longer term trend, you know, we could see in this Labour government a, a decrease, but under the previous national government, a much greater decrease. The previous Labour government under Helen Clark, there was an increase in that as well. The national government before that, there was actually a decrease as well. So it kind of challenged the the view that Labour is always soft, National is always tough findings. So in the longer term, it, these these claims don't really marry up with um, with the, the stats. Uh, and then in the shorter term, I think th- there's definitely evidence that the government is taking a you know what might be seen as as a softer approach. So um, in in terms of of sentencing, potentially some slight tweaks there, um, and and looking at alternative sentences to prison. But again, those trends started before this. This Labour government. So we we saw similar trends under John Key's government. Obviously, there was an increase in the prison population, but in many other areas, there was a, a less punitive approach taken. There's a sense with crime, even if the narrative out there in the public is wrong, does it really matter? It's almost something that's based on feeling. For instance, Jared Gilbert, uh, he was asked to fact check some of the claims about the efficacy of boot camps last year, and he found that they weren't very effective, according to meta-studies globally, but he acknowledged he probably wasn't going to convince anyone about that because just the idea of tougher action intuitively feels right to people. Because they just instinctively sound good to the public, and I absolutely get that, but that doesn't change those data that show that they're just not successful. Is there an extent to which you can scream out the data and the nuance until you're blue in the face, but it won't really win anyone over. Um, I, th- I think that is partly true. I think that, um, yeah, people's reaction to to crime and, and you know, to feeling under threat is, is obviously a strongly emotional reaction. Responding to that with facts and figures isn't necessarily going to, as you say, change anyone's mind. I think that's not a reason not to have a, a kind of a thorough discussion of the data uh, and to try and put it out there as part of this discussion. I think it cuts the other way as well, like we saw in Hawke's Bay uh, around trying to, to use data to kind of rubbish people's claims that there was a threat of crime or crime was happening during in, in the aftermath of Cyclone Gabriel. I think that was a good example of how not to use data. You could be seen as insensitive in this way because we see a lot of coverage of victims of retail crime a lot lately, people having to close their businesses. Are you worried that responding to that with data or nuance can seem insensitive? Yes, we do worry about that. We certainly don't want to come across as saying, well, you're, you know, the crime that you've experienced is one out of 10,000, so it doesn't matter. That's kind of the opposite of, of what we're trying to do. One of the, the big conclusions that we drew was that it is really hard to make bold claims about what's happening with crime based on the, the, the data. It, it is surveys of society, how people feel. It is perceptions, uh, how, how safe people feel. Um, it is speaking to victims and it is also looking at offenders and things like rehabilitation and, and how effective that is. I mean, those are all 
potentially better ways to look at crime in society rather than just cherry picking a couple of stats to show you know a 40 percent increase in, in one type of offending over a certain type of period and and obviously there's difficulties with that when measuring that because things like media reporting obviously do play into that and things like social media the media so you mentioned in your story for instance that ram raids they're a tiny fraction of crime but obviously they're a huge focus of media coverage and that seems almost inevitable. They're such a headline-grabbing type of crime. But at the same time, covering a small percentage of crime is going to give people a distorted picture of the overall crime rates. How do you deal with that? I think we'd be doing a disservice not to report some of these because we, we are definitely seeing a spike and, and whatever you attribute it to, it's, it's you know, a lot of people say it's this post-COVID situation. We've had an increase in, in truancy in schools, and that's led to, you know, more more youth out. And and so th- th- there's an, a real issue there that we need to highlight. But maybe also just to every now and then include that context that it's not part of a broader trend. It is a spike. I've had a discussion with one of our journalists who who basically says that kind of one of the purposes of journalism is to talk about the rare events, uh, so that people kind of understand their lives aren't like that. The flip side of that is is that data journalism kind of exists to tell you what is and isn't a rare event. The challenge for us is how to make that interesting and also how do we do it in a way that um, doesn't lose our readers on, on line three. Yeah, Michael, well, you're a day-to-day journalist normally. You're not always working with Chris on these kinds of large-scale data projects. Do you feel that, that perhaps by reporting something you might be giving readers a distorted picture? I have definitely felt that throughout my career at, at certain points. I mean, right, right now I work in the, the press gallery and, and politics and I feel that pressure a lot a lot less. I would also say, I mean, just speaking for our own company, we're moving into the premium news space. I, I think overall there's, there's less of a pressure to chase clicks as there might have been previously. And it, it's allowed us to do stories like Chris and I have just done. But you know, based on audience numbers, th- these stories are inherently interesting. They grab people's attention. So it's it, it's probably just needs to be a, a stock take of how often we're doing them, how how prominent we're making them, how much it marries up with the stats and the context and the way that we report them. I, I think it is possible. It, it's just it'll take just a bit of reflection. With ram raids, that became a prominent kind of media issue. The police weren't even collecting that as an offence type. When the media first started talking about ram raids and they started showing up every day in Auckland, there wasn't the data there to find out whether or not this was there. And so when, as a result of essentially media pressure or media focus, the police did go back and and, uh, figure out a way of of kind of classifying that as a crime or a class of crime, you know, then it was apparent that, yes, there had been an increase. So almost I think the media is harder on itself than it needs to be. Uh, In this context, I think that sometimes the things that we focus on do actually kind of bring about change. With crime in general, the data doesn't seem to be collated and collected very well or it's being collected in different forms by different agencies. One of your main takeaways from this investigation was just how hard this investigation was. Do you think that we need better ways of surveying and recording crime? We do. The Justice Department actually does do a a very good survey, which they started in 2018, I believe. So the fifth iteration of that survey is coming out sometime in June, so watch this space. How do we actually turn like that rich set of information that the Justice Department will release into something that that grabs our readers? Can we get a verdict? (laughs) The central question of your your investigation, is Labour, the the, the headline of the story, is Labour soft on crime? Is crime out of control? <laughs> so it's a, so a very political question. I think I think it's quite safe to say crime is not out of control. That that's just a um, there's certain types of crime that that uh, are definitely of 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 high concern. You know, ram raids for sure, and and there's probably there's definitely been an increase in, in re- retail crime, uh, even though it's been better reporting. Um, family harm continues to be by far the, the, the biggest offence category. Calling it out of control is, is probably going a bit too far. Yeah, I mean, I basically say you, you can't reliably draw conclusions from reported crime statistics. That's not kind of what they exist for. Uh, and, yeah, and, and as, you know, as we've seen, things like ram rates have increased. I have a rule that one number on its own is almost always misleading, um, and I think that <laughs> applies very much here. 
crime numbers are numbers that need to be uh, looked at in context uh, and, and understood. Thank you very much. Thanks, Aidan. Appreciate Thanks it. Thanks a lot. That was Michael Nielsen, senior political reporter for the New Zealand Herald, and the Herald's data editor, Chris Knox, talking there to Media Watch's Hayden Donnell. Last Thursday, Auckland Council held a heavily reported meeting about its annual budget, the sort of thing that, while significant, hasn't always attracted a lot of public interest or media attention in the past. But with Auckland Mayor Wayne Brown pushing for big cuts now to some services to keep rate rises down and to sell the council shares in Auckland Airport, well, the interest was intense this time. And the media focus was intensified by the way that the mayor made public his proposals one week earlier, but left many in the media on the outside looking in. We've heard from the chair of the Media Freedom Committee, that's RNZ's Richard Sutherland, this afternoon. He wrote a letter to Mayor Brown describing the day's events as troubling and pointing out something most of us know, which is that the media play a crucial role in keeping the public informed. The Mayor's office has returned serve this afternoon, basically saying that the actual reason we couldn't get in was because of a capacity issue at AT. Of course, that differs completely from what media were told earlier today about the fact that they wanted someone who would convey the mayor's message. They also said it wasn't a media event, also puzzling given given some media were invited. I looked at that in this week's Midweek Media Watch, our weekly catch-up with nights here on RNZ National every Wednesday after the 10pm news. And this week, while I was at it, I talked to Todd Zayner about a shake-up of the top brass at Stuff, TVNZ boosting free-to-air sport, a dead radio station winning three national awards, and Nikki Hager honoured in the King's Birthday Honours list for a life spent lifting the lid on secrets. If you missed it, you'll find it on Media Watch's page of the RNZ website, our section of the RNZ app, or... Wherever you get your podcasts, it's in our podcast feed. Now, as you heard there, the outfit representing the news media's mutual interests and their rights and freedoms in particular challenged what it called media cherry-picking by the mayor's people at last weekend's briefing in Auckland. So this week we asked, what was the response to that? Well, Kate Gordy, the head of communications and government relations for the Auckland mayoral office, told the Media Freedom Committee that... When Wayne Brown gave an outline of his budget proposals to invited councillors and representatives of the wider Auckland community, she said a decision was made to invite a small handful of media, and the content was scheduled to be distributed via social media following the event. And she said staff and guests at that briefing were disappointed with the conduct of some media who disrupted it by forcing their way in. And in spite of reporters being told that those best able to spread the mayor's message had been preferred, Kate Gordy said this... We are surprised that the mayoral office is being accused of inviting those who we think will give the mayor an easy ride. Among those journalists was New Zealand Herald senior writer Simon Wilson. Now earlier this week Simon Wilson himself also said that he was surprised to be invited to that event as he told the Working Group podcast in which he was introduced like this by the host Martin Bradbury. The mayor of Auckland considers him as toxic as a urinal cake in Chernobyl. Herald columnist and Auckland's favourite son, Simon Wilson. Kia ora, Kome. Welcome back to the show. to you, Bomber. Now, that was a reference to a news hub debate during the mayoral election campaign last year in which Wayne Brown told those assembled, off the air but with cameras running, that if he won, he would stick pictures of Simon Wilson's face on the council's building urinals in response to the coverage which Wayne Brown obviously objected to. Now, that was a joke, obviously, but Simon Wilson meant it when he said this on the Working Group podcast earlier this week about the mayor and the media. He doesn't appear to understand what the role of the media is. I mean, he told his uh, meeting last week he didn't care if he wasn't talking to the media because he wanted to talk to ratepayers. Well, you know, that's how you talk to ratepayers. And one of the things we had asked was, could we live stream this? Which is a way for him to talk directly to ratepayers, unmediated by anything else. But he said no to that as well. Well, that's all we have for you on the media this weekend, but we'll be back with more with Midweek Media Watch after the 10pm news during nights next Wednesday and then back with more Media Watch at the same time next weekend here on RNZ National.